He's such a professional. <laughs> uh, well, good morning. Thank you, Mr. President, for those very, very warm and, and very uh, thoughtful, obviously it came from the heart, uh, words of introduction. It just reminds me of a time in my previous life when someone was saying things like that about yours truly. He's a very warm and very compassionate legislator. He's a very warm, very thoughtful. My wife was sitting there. She found it insufferable. We went home that night. I'm watching the, uh, the Red Sox. She takes out a little dictionary. She says, Jim, look at the definition of warm. So I said, okay, look at it. Warm, not so hot. <laughs> okay, well, <clears throat> politics and eggs is very hot. And that's because of Neil and his great team here. And uh, we want to thank all of them again. And by the team of the New England Council, Larry in particular, does a great job. Uh, again, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge all of the wonderful sponsors um, who provide the, uh, the, the forums, the, the, uh, the breakfast, the luncheons for all of the distinguished guests that come by here. It uh, wouldn't be possible without them. So if you see any of these representatives of the banners of the companies, you should say thank you for what a corporate citizen they are to do something like this. Uh, 2019 is off to an incredibly busy start. Uh, believe it or not, I think this is our seventh uh, Politics and Eggs event, <clears throat> and it's only two months into the year. The next Politics and Eggs breakfast will take place on March 8th, right here at the Institute. Looking forward to hearing from the Mayor of South Bend, Indiana, Pete Buttigieg, and the, uh, the Council will be back here again uh, in New Hampshire on February, on, I should say, on um, on March 18th, where we'll have the newly elected congressman from the 1st Congressional District. Uh, Chris Pappas will be speaking at the, at the New England Council at the Bedford Village Inn. Uh, and if anyone wants to go to Washington this week, we have a congressman from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Bill Keating will be speaking to the New England Council on Wednesday and then Thursday morning. The junior senator from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, Ed Markey, will be speaking to the New England Council in Washington this week. But today we're very pleased to uh, welcome a member of Congress who has quickly established himself as a rising star in the Democratic uh, Party, and that is California Congressman Eric Swalwell. Congressman was born and spent his early childhood in another important presidential primary state, and that's Iowa, before his, ma his family settled into uh, Dublin, California, in the Bay Area. He got his uh, start in public service at a very young age, uh, serving on the city council in College Park, Maryland, well as an undergraduate at the University of Maryland. He also interned on uh, Capitol Hill. He went on to receive his law degree from the University of Maryland as well as, uh, as, well as before returning to California to work as a prosecutor in Alameda uh, County. <clears throat> he also served in several municipal offices in his hometown of Dublin, including city council. 2012, he ran for United States Congress in California's newly redrawn 15th congressional district challenging a Democratic incumbent. Many of you know uh, the name, Pete Stark. <clears throat> the Congressman uh, uh, Swalwell uh, prevailed and has been elected three times. Last month, he sworn in to his fourth uh, term. Soon after taking office in 2013, he helped form the United Solutions Caucus, which is a bipartisan group of freshman House members who meet regularly to discuss areas of agreement. Uh, his bipartisan efforts have paid off. At the end of his first term, our guest speaker this morning had successfully gotten three bills passed by the United States House and two signed into law, more than any other freshman. In the 116th Congress, he serves on the House Judiciary Committee and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, where he recently became chairman of the Intelligence Modernization and Readiness Subcommittee. We are pleased today to welcome him to the Granite State as he considers his political future possible run for president in 2020, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to the Honorable Congressman Eric Walwa. Yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jim, uh, for that. Stephen, uh, thank you as well. St. Anselm, thank you for hosting uh, this traditional uh, breakfast and, and also uh, to the students. Uh, this is much earlier than I ever would have gotten up on a Monday morning, so uh, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I have to say, uh, when I was reading about uh, the, the, the program and what you do, I saw that instead of being at your offices on a Monday morning, you're here uh, eating breakfast, having coffee, 
riffing about politics and maybe perhaps sending out a few tweets, I thought, oh, I get it, executive time. <laughs> I also think, having been in Iowa last week and New Hampshire this past weekend, I'm starting to get on to you guys. We're going from Des Moines to Iowa City, and we came across last Sunday a car stuck in the snow, spinning its wheels, and got out and helped push the car out of the snow. Yesterday, as I was leaving Concord and going to Bedford, a local legislator had a dead battery, so I got out and, you know, uh, Steve uh, Marchand and I waited for another car that could actually help arrive. So I think I'm on to what's going on here. So just last night, I was going over the Heimlich maneuver just for this morning's breakfast, <laughs> just in case. I know the vetting and the scrutiny that our candidates have to go through. My wife asked me the other day, she said, so just how many Democratic presidential candidates do you think they're going to be? And I said, well, the, the debates are coming up pretty soon. And in June, Ray, we're going to have the first debates. I told her that the requirement to get on the debate stage, you have to poll at least 1%. And my wife, working in sales, being a numbers person, looked at me and she said, ah, I got it. So no more than 100. So no more than 100 when you're planning out how many more of these you're going to have to have. But th thank you for having me here uh, this morning. Uh, I, I want to talk to you about the promise of America and what I learned about that promise riding my bicycle through an old steel town at 6 a.m. in the morning and how I got there. I'm the son of a cop and a mom who raised four young boys making dollhouses in the garage, baking wedding cakes in the kitchen, selling them to the community, and in our living room running a very large, unlicensed daycare facility. So we didn't have much, but my parents dreamed big, and they believed that if they worked hard enough, they could see me, their firstborn, be the first in our family to go to college. And so they dug deeply and sacrificed everything to make that happen. And we moved from Iowa to Oregon, up and down California. And when I was able to work, they expected that I would work as hard as they would. And so at age nine, I got a paper route. And before I'd start my route, I'd always look at the real estate listings, circling the homes that I hoped we could afford, because I was tired of packing up and moving, making new pen pals, moving to new school districts, and putting those listings in front of my parents hoping we could root ourselves in the community where we were settled. And then I get on my bike, and I got a pretty good idea that the American dream was alive and well on some blocks on my route, but not others. There were big houses and small houses. There were homes with two cars and homes with none. And there were homes that didn't receive the newspaper at all. And as I rode my bike, I just wish that one day we could buy and root ourselves in a home of our own. So we kept moving. I was frustrated. And finally, as Jim pointed out, settled in a little town called Dublin, California. I like to say sister city to Dublin, New Hampshire. Ours is just a little bit bigger. But we rooted ourselves there and kept working hard, put my myself and my brothers in a school district that could give me a shot to go to college. If I wasn't playing youth soccer, my parents had me refereeing. If I wasn't playing baseball, they had me umpiring, doing all we could to pool our money together to make sure we could all enjoy ourselves and for my soccer, help me get better and eventually get a Division I soccer scholarship. So I went out to college in the South, a school called Campbell University which met three necessary criteria. One, they paid for it, which was an absolute must. Two, it was Division I. I was very competitive, still am today. And three, they allowed me to play as a freshman. Very impatient, still am today. Later today, I'll be joining the University of New Hampshire women's soccer team, where my wife is just terrified about what's going to happen when I get in the goal as a goalkeeper and take their shots. <laughs> but that's what I did to get to college. I stood between two posts and 11 other players and took shots 
to my hands, to my head, to my gut, knowing that that was my path to get a college degree. And my parents are proud. We had made it. The promise of America had come to their son. I went on to law school and came back home and worked as a prosecutor. I remember right before starting my first day at the DA's office in Oakland, California, I told my mom, Mom, you and Dad worked so hard, dug so deep. I took different odd jobs. You took different odd jobs. But we made it. I think it's time that you reward yourselves with a vacation. My mom looked at me, and she kind of laughed and said, Honey, we did work hard. You did put your head down. But there's no vacation in our future. She told me that to get me through that last semester of law school, help me with the bar prep fees that I had to pay. During one of the panicked calls home, where I was afraid I was going to be dropped from classes, that she had to take a payday loan. And that those loans come with high interest rates. And although there was no vacation in their future, they were proud that the promise of America had been fulfilled for their hard work. The promise of America that no matter who you are, where you're from, who you love, who you worship, who your parents are, if you work hard, put your head down, you do better for yourself, and you look at your kids and dream bigger for their future. That's the promise. But I saw on that paper route, and then later as a prosecutor, that that promise was not reaching every block of every community. I would sit in West Oakland apartment buildings interviewing young homicide witnesses. Too often the victims were young black men. The defendants who would be put away for life were young black men. And the witnesses I talked to were young black men. And I'd sit in their apartments and I'd listen to the piercing sounds of police sirens drowning out our conversation. I'd look across the street and I'd see payday lenders in liquor stores the only local commerce. I'd ask about their schools and learn that overhead projectors were the best technologies that they had in their classroom. Didn't matter how hard that young man worked, didn't matter how smart he was, that promise of America was broken as far as he's concerned. Got elected to Congress in 2012 and immediately went to work to try and bring more young people into the Congress, and lead young people who were there across America. Started a group called Future Forum of our youngest Democratic members. Frankly, we were just tired of being the IT help desk to our more senior members. <laughs> we set up a lot of Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram accounts, and we thought it's time to take our act on the road and listen to and learn from the next generation. And as I went across over 26 states, I saw that what I saw on my paper route, what I saw in West Oakland, was the same in places like Indiana, Kansas, Kentucky, Tennessee, that there was a sense of feeling disconnected. Annie Custer brought me here to New Hampshire. Your former mayor of New Hampshire was a part of that visit. Your former mayor of Manchester was a part of that visit. He's back here today. And I learned that for too many communities, including in New Hampshire, that the best export is smart young people who go away to college and never come back because of a lack of infrastructure. The promise of America not reaching all Americans. But after seven years in Congress, after seeing the grit and hard work pay off for my parents, I'm convinced that the best way to bring that promise of America to all Americans is to go big on the issues we take on, on education, on health care, on infrastructure, and gun violence, to be bold in the solutions that we execute, and to do good in the way that we govern. Go big, be bold, do good. And then you do better for yourself 
and dream bigger for your kids. And doing better for yourself, that's not just the things you can count. Stains, buying a home, having retirement, having health insurance. Today, we see a stock market that is raging, unemployment rates that are at the lowest in our history, and a GDP that's on the rise. But that's not the economy. That's not the economy. The economy is you, how you're doing, whether you have enough to save to buy a home, whether you can survive a $1,000 unexpected emergency, and whether you're living paycheck to paycheck or not. It's the things you can count when you do better, and it's the things that you can't count. Peace, security, safety, stability. The things that you work so hard to provide that fills you with a sense of pride when you do it. Go big, be bold, do good. When it comes to health care, no more nibbling around the edges. I've seen in too many places in America that the health care plan for a community is a hollowed out candy jar with a flyer with a picture of someone who lives locally, who has a rare disease or has been in a car accident, and their best chance at getting care is your charity at the checkout register. That can't be the health care plan in America. It's time to have universal coverage, a public option with a pool so big you cover the risk, including people with pre-existing conditions, but also a pool so big that you put competition and pressure on the private insurers to bring down their costs. But I hope that as we go so big on health care, we also don't forget what we do best as Americans. Strive to solve the unsolvable, cure the uncurable, bring hope to people who have lost it. Instead of $1.6 trillion in tax cuts, where 83% of the benefits went to 1% of Americans, we should have a 10-year trillion dollar cures in our lifetime program to look every Alzheimer's, cancer, ALS, Parkinson's patient in the eye and tell them that we are going to study Genetics, data sharing, targeted therapies, and reduce the cost of healthcare that way. Extend the quality of life and put a whole new generation of scientists to work. Go big, be bold, do good. When it comes to education, my parents chased our backwards education plan where a community's children's future depends on the wealth of that individual community, property taxes, funding our schools. I propose that we include in our infrastructure spending school construction costs so that every child in every community, regardless of the wealth of their community, has a modern school to prepare them. And when it comes to college, going big and being bold means that no longer is college associated with the word debt. And for too many families, especially in New Hampshire, that's the word that they're associating it with. I would offer a college bargain. If you work through college, through work study, and you come out through part-time volunteer service hours and lift up and help out a community in need, Still do your full-time job, but you pledge to commit service hours to people who need it the most. You can get a debt-free education. If you work for college, college should work for you in America. It's not free college. It's a bargain. You work, it works for you. But it won't put another generation in the financial quicksand of student loan debt, a debt that I know all too well. I've got just under $100,000 of it. My wife still said yes a couple years ago when I asked her to marry me. But we see as a young family ourselves with two kids under two that that $500 check every month is really hard to write for a lot of America's families. 
This generation is starting families later. We're the least homeowning generation America's ever known. And we're the least entrepreneurial generation America's ever known. Three solutions to lift us out of student loan debt. First, bring the federal interest rate down to zero. That's over $120 million a year that the federal government makes on student loans. Put that money back in the pockets of young families. Allow every graduate to refinance and negotiate for a competitive rate, just as you can on a mortgage or a commercial loan. And allow employers, like so many of the large companies sponsoring this event today, allow employers who very much would be eager to do this, contribute to their employees' student loan debt tax-free, and for the employee to receive that contribution tax-free. Go big, be bold, do good. On the environment, too often our workforce is told that they have to choose between addressing clean air and clean water and their job. I'd choose my job if that was my choice. Addressing something that will be catastrophic in 10 to 15 years or feeding my family today, I'd choose my job. If we can't look a pipe fitter, a laborer, people who work outside and use their hands and work in fossil fuel economies, if we can't look them in the eye and tell them that as we transition to this new green economy, you're not going to lose a paycheck. You're not going to lose your dignity. We're not going to have them. But the solution is within reach. First, at those fossil fuel extraction jobs, we can deploy carbon capture and carbon sequestration technologies. Invest in those technologies today. Deploy them there so that we're carbon neutral or negative carbon. And then have a bridge with a skills guarantee so that those workers can go into a green color economy where we invest in infrastructure dollars in greening the grid through wind, solar, alternative fuel cells, and storage. And for communities like some in New Hampshire who are suffering from PFAS in their water, or like Flint, Michigan, who still have to drink out of bottled water, that we would fund the Environmental Protection Agency and also give those communities genetic testing resources so they can truly understand what they're predisposed to and whether what they're suffering from is because of their DNA code or their zip code. Go big, be bold, do good. Doing better, the things you can count and the things that you can't. And one of the things that you can't count but you just feel is safety. If you talk to a high schooler today, heck, even a middle schooler today, they will tell you they are filled with fear in their classrooms. Filled with the fear that they will be the next victims of a mass shooting. And the reality that if that happens, they'll be forgotten weeks later when the next one occurs. And in between, they know a Washington itself is too afraid to make them safe. Well, the good news is this week we are going to pass in the House of Representatives background checks on every firearm purchase. First time since 1993 that significant gun legislation will be passed. But background checks only go so far. I hope that understanding this epidemic, that we go so big and be so bold to ban and buy back the most dangerous weapons, assault rifles, and take them out of the hands of the most dangerous people. And if they're not going to be sold back, we restrict their use to hunting clubs and shooting ranges. Australia did that after their last mass shooting, and they haven't had one since. Go big, be bold, do good. These are all solutions that are within reach and challenge us as Americans to do what we do best. Solve the unsolvable. And finally, on doing good. To me, that means as a country, we lead 
from a core set of principles, not by transactions that help people in government or their families. It means that as we take on trade and predatory behavior from countries like China, that we call it out because it's the right thing to do and it's hurting American workers, but we also recognize that the best way to take on a bully on the playground is to have the most friends on the playground. And you bond together with other victim countries who have also had intellectual property stolen by the Chinese, who also are victims of the currency manipulation, also have seen their steel dumped. And you bond together and you're stronger together. And when you address the threats that our country faces across the globe, doing good means you lean strongly on your alliances. You hold up NATO. You're grateful that you have a presence in South Korea and not ask them to spend more for us to be there, but recognize that having a strategic location next to China gives us more out of it than the South Koreans get. And it means that having alliances ends up costing us less in our national defense. And breaking those alliances will only cost us more taking money away from schools and medicine. Today, if you're a parent looking at the playground as the world stage, you will have seen your child in the last two years go from hanging out with the honor roll kids, the Brits, the French, the Germans, the Australians, to now your child's with the detention crew, the Russians, the Turks, the Saudis, countries whose governments don't look like ours. Go big, be bold, do good. That's a vision to bring the promise of America to all Americans. In 1941, Franklin Roosevelt said every man, woman, child should have four freedoms. The freedom of speech, the freedom of worship, the freedom from fear, and the freedom from want. All four of those have had a wrecking ball taken to them in this last two years. The freedom of speech. Our press declared the enemy of the American people. The freedom of worship. A country whose symbol is a statue of liberty. We have a Muslim ban in place. The freedom from fear, or the freedom from fear mongering. We're told to be afraid of new invented scaravans every single week. And the freedom from want. A social security system, not perfect, but one we pay into, must protect, must grow, at risk of being raided to pay for $1.6 trillion in tax cuts and the debt that they created. Let's restore those four freedoms. But let's go so big, be so bold, do so good, that we add a fifth freedom, a uniquely American freedom, the freedom to dream, the dream that my parents dreamed for me in an Iowa driveway when I would tell my dad when he'd bring the police cruiser home, I want to be a cop just like you. And he would tell me, son, it doesn't work that way. I want you to go to college. And then when you do that, I want you to go to law school and do justice in the courtroom just like I had to do on the street. It's the dream that every New Hampshire family dreams for their kids. If you're free to learn, you're free to dream. If you're free to breathe clean air and drink clean water, you're free to dream. If you're free from discrimination, you're free to dream. If you're free to vote, you're free to dream. And if you're free to ride your bicycle, freeze your face off, look at the biggest house on the block, and believe that if you work hard, one day you can live in that house, you're free to dream. That's the promise of America. Not yet fulfilled for all Americans. But I think that's why you're here today, believing that as Republicans, as Democrats, as independents, we're not as divided as we're told we're supposed to be. We all believe in that promise. And we should do all we can to link our arms and make sure it reaches everywhere. 
Thank you so much. Everyone hear the question? What's the mandate of the Intelligence Committee as it compares to Special Counsel Mueller's investigation? So there's some crossover, but you know, the Special Counsel's responsibility is to find and prosecute crimes. So that means he can really only tell us through indictments what he and his team can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the highest standard in the land. And I'll give you an example of what he could not tell you. Say, just for example, there was a intercept, a phone call of a Russian A talking to Russian B about Trump campaign member C. And they said, hey, we had a great meeting with Trump campaign member C. If the only way you can prove that that meeting occurred is through that intercept, one, you know you would never get those Russians into court. Two, it's hearsay. You couldn't use that. You couldn't rely on that to prove your case. You couldn't even bring an indictment and try and work backwards into it. The ethics of being a prosecutor wouldn't let you do it. But it still is evidence. And our job on the Intelligence and the Judiciary Committee is to follow the evidence and tell the American people what happened and let them reach the conclusion. We don't have that standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So we're looking for all evidence. And just making sure the American people know that evidence is not a conclusion. Now, we are also looking at financial crimes. We're not sure if the Mueller team is looking at financial compromise. If you look at the indictments so far and the reports of who's been before the grand jury, it's unclear if he's looking at that. But in our investigation and in free press reporting, we have seen that for decades, the Trump business has sought to do business in Russia and that Russians have sought to do business with the Trump family and its business. We have two different Trump children saying that they've had millions of dollars flowing in from Russia. Then you look at the lender that the Trump organization uses, Deutsche Bank. And just in 2017, Deutsche Bank was fined $300, billion, $300 million for a multi-billion dollar Russian money laundering scheme. So you have reason to look. And the reason you look is not palace intrigue. It's because you want to know if national security decisions are being made counter to what our American values are because a president could be financially compromised. And when you look at the evidence of whether that may be the case, I think everyone would agree the policy toward Russia is certainly different than any Republican or Democratic president has ever had. Not wrong on its face, but if that policy is being driven because of prior financial dealings, then that's a real issue. And that's why you look. And do you think there'll be other indictments of people who have already testified in front of your committee? So the question was, do I believe there'll be other indictments of people who testified before our committee? We sent over to the Mueller team uh, just two weeks ago uh, all of the transcripts from all of our interviews. It was a frustrating experience because they were voluntary interviews. And a lot of these people were not worthy of being taken at their word. So they would come in, and sometimes my Republican colleagues would even tell them during tough questioning, hey, this interview is voluntary. If you don't want to be here, you can leave. And you'll see that when our transcripts are made public. And believe it or not, one of the witnesses actually said, I'm going to take your advice and leave. So they weren't under subpoena although it's still a crime to lie to Congress under subpoena or not. But we weren't able to press for further testimony. We weren't able to subpoena bank records, cell phone logs, hotel travel records, where you wanted to test and contradict or corroborate 
testimony, we weren't able to do that. I do believe, though, just based on putting all these stories together, that there are others who are exposed for false statements. Okay. Uh, Marilyn from uh, AARP. Uh, thank you, Carolyn. Uh, they are uh, too high, and I, I hear it from uh, my mom and dad, who you know worked hard. My mom still works today; she's got health insurance, uh, but still, uh, she can't figure out uh, an inconsistent uh, pricing system. And I just two weeks ago, I went and picked up Tamiflu uh, for my 21-month-old, and the technician at CVS looked at me and she said, "Ooh, five dollars for you, two hundred and fifty dollars if you don't have insurance," and so. That inconsistency, you can imagine, it's either making Americans sicker because they're just not going to pay the $250, or it's wiping them out. What I would do is first allow Medicare to compete for the cost of prescription drugs just as the VA system can, which has reduced the cost for VA, uh, people who are VA recipients. Second, I would make sure that universal coverage, a public option, included the cost of prescription drugs. Third. I would put more competition into and shine more transparency onto the pharmaceutical industry to make sure that there is not price fixing. And four, I would really lean on the innovation I was talking about, making sure that the National Institutes of Health, public research dollars, had scientists working to find cures in our lifetime that would bring down the overall cost and expand access for people who need cures and therapies the most. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Congressman. My name morning, is Matt man. Mayberry from Dover. I'm a veteran. 10% of our state is comprised of veterans and issues that affect them. During our time together, a veteran in the United States will have committed suicide, one every 65 minutes. Could you please talk a little bit about issues affecting veterans and what you would do about them and what you have done about them during your time in Congress? Which branch do you serve in? Air Force. Air Force. Thank you for doing that. Um, First, uh, with our veterans, uh, I would make sure that before we fund any future military Department of Defense programs, we would make sure that every veteran who has already served is receiving the medical care they need, the mental health care they need, has a jobs guarantee because the skills that you got overseas or serving on a base here in the United States matter and shouldn't leave you homeless. But also, I believe that some of these issues on background checks help us reduce suicides when it comes to knowing more about who's purchasing a firearm and, and striving to see that as a way to also reduce the number of veterans. I'm most worried right now about the million young veterans who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so many of them, I, I've been told, uh, have just ghosted, meaning that once they left their service, they didn't stay in touch with the federal government. They didn't want to be a part of any local American legion. They didn't want to have any local services. And they're out on their own. And I want to do all we can to find them, to let them know that we are there for a lifelong of care if they need it. And veterans, as I know, are very modest and very proud. They want to believe that they can take care of themselves, and that's usually the case. But we have to take care of them if that's not the case. What have I done for veterans? Well, in addition to legislation I've supported to increase access to seeing a doctor if your own VA is overcrowded, I have a local veterans group who is at two of our community colleges, and they told me they were having a hard time recruiting people into the group. And I sat down with them recently and said, well, what do you all like to do? I said, why don't you do a baseball game? They said, we tried it. It didn't work. So why don't you guys go bowling? I said, we did that. It didn't work. I said, well, guys, speak up. What do you like to do? And one of them leaned forward and kind of whispered and said, sir, we'd like to shoot. 
So I asked our local sheriff if he'd open up the range. And we took a bunch of veterans to the sheriff's range. And the sheriff's office used it as a recruiting tool and actually hired some of the veterans who went out there with me and shot. We're going to do that again in a couple more weeks. But just trying to be inventive and in getting them to just present and join these veteran service organizations so that if they do have issues, they can get the help need. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> Other questions uh, for uh, special guest here this morning? Uh, well, if not, I just ask you uh, the last question, uh, not to put any pressure on you, but um, <laughs> Governor Wells spoke to politics and things, and he made news. Yeah. I don't know if you want to make any news. <laughs> <laughs> This is the forum to make. I just between, uh, I not go any further. Yeah. But if you want to make any news. Well, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, I will predict that uh, in this upcoming football season, you guys are going to want Jimmy G back because we're expecting big things out of him in San Francisco. But uh, I will say this. I, I'm here in February on a Monday morning, not because I want to see all the Dublins that are in the United States. And I did yesterday see Dublin, New Hampshire. It's because I am considering running for president. I do believe I'm connected to that everyday American experience of grit and resiliency, but believing that it adds up to something. But recognizing, because I've had the privilege of working as a prosecutor, working as a congressman, going to different parts of America, recognizing that that promise of America has not reached everyone, and that you need someone who's connected who has student loan debt, who has a young family, who's going to have to live with these decisions that they make for a very long time, and that you're going to need someone who generationally is optimistic that you can take the inventiveness of this generation and project it and be a bridge to a Washington that's so pessimistic, and that the experience of knowing who our threats are for the last couple of years on the Intelligence Committee, the threats that we face on the outside and the threats that we face on the inside, that that experience matters, and that upholding the rule of law ensures that everything we care about still stands. That's why I'm considering it. It's an honor to be here with you today. Thank you for inviting me, and I promise you'll see more of me across the Granite State. Thank you.